Hey everyone, welcome to Yoga Land's Yoga Teacher Companion. I'm your host, Jason Crandall. In this episode, I'm gonna break down my seven favorite backbends to teach beginners. Before we do that, I want you to know that this is truly a companion. On Yoga Land, we just published an episode about the benefits and the challenges of teaching backbends to beginners. So that's gonna give you a little bit deeper, more in-depth conversation about the context of teaching backbends, whereas this episode is gonna be a little bit more instructional about teaching the specific backbend. So they'll pair really well together and help you help your students. For those of you that are interested in learning more about working with beginners, I have a really exceptional all online training called The Art of Teaching Beginners. I'll put the link for that in my bio below. And if you wanna go even more deeply into your yoga teacher studies or yoga studies, I also have an upcoming 200 hour training online. I'll put the link for that in the, uh, in the copy below. So to begin, we are gonna look at my three favorite face down backbends. Then after that, we'll look at my two favorite kneeling backbends and how I adapt them to beginners. And then we'll conclude with a couple of reclined backbends. And I think all of this information is gonna really help you serve your students. Enjoy. Let's begin with looking at how I like to teach locust pose to beginners. There are two really important details that might be a little bit different from what you've come across uh, in working with these poses in the past. So first, when I'm working with beginners, I'm really prioritizing in this pose, strength of the back body, including strength of the glutes and the external rotators. So it is totally reasonable in this pose to raise the legs, keep them parallel and internally rotate the legs. But I don't like to do that for beginners. And the reason I don't is you're not gonna recruit as much musculature of the back of the pelvis and hips that way. So what I prefer for beginners is I like to hug those two inner legs together. So it'll be either the inner thighs or the feet that will come together, it just depends on the student's body. But that slight external rotation and adduction is going to provide much more muscular engagement of that posterior side. And again, when we're looking at teaching this pose to beginners, I want to build that robustness. The second thing I want us to see is, for beginners, how we work the arms. So instead of having the arms raised and the palms facing the side body, everybody, I really like to rotate the palms down. By rotating the palms down, right, I'm still lifting the hands and the arms, but by rotating the palms down, what I'm able to do for beginners is create much more strength in the external rotators of the shoulders. So, of course, I'm drawing the shoulder blades towards each other and drawing the shoulder blades down. So all those typical cues, I think, are, you know, they're always going to be in place but really attuning to that external rotation, that adduction of the legs, and that external rotation of the upper arm for your beginners I think is really key. Now the next thing everybody is Cobra. And when I teach beginners Cobra, there are a couple of details that I want you to understand. First, I almost always phase the pose. So what I mean by this is like I have two phases of Cobra. And in the first phase of Cobra, everybody, what I'm really always doing is hovering the hands. Because what I wanna do in this hovering of the hands, similar to locust, is I wanna focus on strength. And I wanna focus specifically on scapular strength and control. So we're lifting the front of the shoulders up, we're drawing the shoulder blades towards each other and drawing the shoulder blades down. So we're getting that engagement, everybody, of that mid to upper back. We wanna create that strength and that control, right? That's the first phase. Then the second phase is I like to have my new students take the fingertips to the floor in line with the center of the chest. Now, th there's a lot of different places that you could work, but if the hands are too far forward for beginners, when they come up, they're just gonna push into their lower back. And that's not really what we want at this stage of the game. Probably any stage of the game, but certainly not this stage of the game. So for beginners, I want the fingertips when they come to the floor to be in line with the center of the chest. Then two things, everybody, I want students to feel that drawing of the elbows in 
that pressing of the pubic bone down, and then that gentle drive of the hands into the floor. So I kind of talk to my students about this being about mid-sized cobra, right? We have our really low cobra, which is our first phase, and that to me is our hands are not engaging into the floor. We just have that hug in. Then that second phase with the fingers in line with the center of the chest, we're hugging the elbows in, we're keeping that scapular retraction and descent, and then we're just giving a little bit of press of the hands into the floor. Then the third thing I love to teach for beginners, everybody, and I, arguably I teach these at all stages of development, uh, but you know we're specifically talking about beginners, is Sphinx. And the thing that I really like about Sphinx, everybody, it's less about the strength that is generated, which we focused on in the last two poses, but now it's a little bit more about spinal control. So what I mean by that, everybody, first, I like the elbows to be directly under the shoulders, the palms facing down, and then a lot of times, even at higher level students, what people do is they just, with the hands, press down. But what you really want to teach your students to do, right, and if you don't know this, you should totally bring this into your practice and your, this pose is going to finally come alive. You gently press the pubic bone down, you gently lift the navel up, and then with the hands as you press down, you also slightly grip and slightly pull the ground. I want students to get that tactile aid, that press down, but that gentle grip and pull. Because when students get that grip and pull, then they start to really get that feeling of lengthening the thoracic spine, okay? So in locust, we're really prioritizing recruiting as much posterior strength as we can. In the two phases of cobra, we're focused on scapular control and strength, hand position, and a little bit that usage of the arms to create more back bend. And then in Sphinx pose, we're really getting a little bit more nuance of how that pubic bone presses down into the floor, but also how we can use the arms to create length through the whole spine. There are two kneeling back bends that I love. One is an overt classic back bend, the other is a little bit more of a preparation. Let's start there. So Anjaneyasana, and what I call in all my trainings, new school Anjaneyasana, is really great for beginners. So what I mean by new school is, first, let's think about old school. In old school Anjaneyasana, which I still teach once in a long while, we have more of a heavier presentation of the hips, meaning we're dropping those hips forward and down, right? So we're taking this back hip deeper into extension, we're getting a little bit more load forward and down into the hip joint, right? Now, new school, we have a slightly shorter stride. We have the ball of the back foot to the floor. We have more overt posterior pelvic tilt, and we have more anterior engagement of the core. So we're more upright. Now, as we stay in this upright position, we press that back foot into the floor, we lengthen the buttock down, and we draw the front ribs in. So you can see compared to old school, which I'll show again, right? In new school Anjaneyasana, we're more directly upright and we're more engaged. Now the reason that I really like this for new students, I like this for everybody, for, but for new students, everybody, this is going to teach students to lengthen and strengthen their hip flexors and quads and it's gonna take less stress off the anterior part of the hip socket itself. When you're kinda of heavy and low here, you might get a stretch in the front of that hip socket, but for newer students, I really prefer more engagement, more control, and more feedback of the whole body. Now, the second kneeling back bend that I like to teach everybody is camel. There's two nuances to how I like to teach camel. I really, when I'm working with new students, try to de-emphasize how far you can go in one part of your spine, and I try to emphasize how well you can move the whole spine. 
So what I'm looking for in all of these back bends, and we start to really feel it more in camel, is the lower back, the middle back, and the upper back all having about the same amount of sensation, okay? And the first way I like to do that is camel pose with the hands on the hips, okay? And this is not super exciting, but with the camel pose, hands on hips, elbows together, students can use their thumbs on the top rim of the buttock to pull down a little bit. That gives the spine something to lift from. So even just getting that to new students, like that concept, I think as teachers, we're, we're familiar with the concepts, we probably use the grounding and lifting concept, right? But this is another iteration of that, or this is another example of that more accurately. On our hands, we're just kind of pulling down on our hips. And you don't even have to be tucking the tailbone. You just literally, with your hands, pull straight down, like you're pulling your thighs more into the ground. So we're pulling down, and that's gonna give us something to lift our chest from. Then when we wanna take the pose a little bit further, it's nice to use blocks. If you don't have blocks, you can still do this. You can come to the ball of the feet. But essentially what we wanna have are blocks next to the ankles. And when we're taking the hands to blocks, everybody, we're gonna want those fingers turned, that we're gonna want the fingers turned in the same direction as the toes, okay? So look at the screen. Instead of having the hands here, which is gonna slightly internally rotate the arm, we want that arm rotated outwards, okay? So kind of if the hand was coming to the heel, the hand would be on the inside, not the outside, because we want that external rotation to the arm. So we can start with the hands on the hips, kind of pull down, get that lift to the chest, just like a nice baby arch. Then we can shift back. The hips do not need to stay over the knees, I promise you. Then we just get those fingertips to the block. And we want those hands rotated so the thumbs are forward, the fingertips are back. And then we just create a simple little arch. And again, what I'm looking for is lower back, middle back, upper back, all equal arch. Now for new students, I want the chin slightly tucked and facing forward. Let me show you my two favorite reclined backbends to teach beginners. Um, the first is just a really nice, simple, passive backbend over a block. If you don't have a block, but you have a bolster or some rolled blankets, that can do just as well. Um, and then after that, we'll look at how I like to teach bridge pose to newer students. Now, for the block, everybody, it's really important that it's between students' shoulder blades. And that can be a little bit difficult to communicate. Even if you communicate it perfectly, students don't always get the location right. So just be mindful that this is gonna be something you're gonna to have to keep your eyes on and often troubleshoot, okay? So what we wanna do here is, I like to have my students start with knees bent, feet on the floor, and come onto their elbows. Then from here, you can kind of scooch around and start to lean back until that shoulder, until the scapula uh, connect with the block, right? Then from here, it's really key that we interlace the fingers and cup the back of the head. I don't want students just to like lay back and flop the arms. The neck gets really like shortened in the back, overstretched in the front, the arms get into this sloppy position. So we keep the head up, we interlace the fingers, we hug the elbows slightly in. Then from there, everybody, when we bring the head to the floor, we keep that interlace of the fingers and we actually bring the back of the hands with the head to the floor. We're using the hands to gently lengthen the back of the skull. And then we have two choices from here. We can keep this interlace and keep cupping the head. This is really nice. The other choice is to bring the back of the skull to the floor, interlace the fingers, and reach through the arms. When we do this, I like to interlace all the fingers except for the index fingers. I like to kind of straighten them and point through them. Again, I don't like when new students just like bend the elbows and have those arms splayed and the head gets turned. It just gets really sloppy really quick. So either keep the fingers occupied by cupping the back of the skull or a good strong straightening the arms. Now, from here, when it comes to teaching bridge pose, okay? When it comes to teaching bridge toes pose to beginners, 
There is one really simple thing that gets overlooked by virtually every teacher on the planet. I overlooked this for at least two decades of teaching yoga. Wherever we tell our students to place the feet, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, we usually have people lay on their back and then we tell them what to do with their feet, right? Like lay on your back, take your feet hip width apart, feet parallel to each other, blah, blah, blah. My point on this is when someone's laying on their back, they have no idea where their feet are. They, they can't see them and it's really hard to feel them. So what you want to do if you are discerning and specific with where you want your students to place their feet, have them place their feet there before they get in the pose, okay? So watch, this is so basic. We just sit, take our feet on the ground, and we just look at them, right? So if you're like, I want your heels and your sitting bones close together, right? Like, okay then bring your heels and your sitting bones close together, like get that together. If you want the feet hip width and parallel, then communicate that when they're sitting up and they can see, oh, that's hip width, that's parallel. If, like me, you want the feet about as wide as the yoga mat and slightly turned out, then I'm gonna have people set that before they lay back, okay? So that's kind of the first detail and that's agnostic of where you're going to have them put their feet. The point on this is get them to see their feet when you're asking them to put their feet in a certain position. That's the first detail. The second detail, and I have in many different conversations on Yoga Land, on the Teacher's Companion, in, on Instagram, in my trainings, talked about the value and the non-dangerousness, I know that, I don't think that's a real word, but the non-dangerousness of having the feet wider than the hips and turned out in back bends. So I'm not gonna relitigate all that right now. What I'm gonna tell you at very least is taking the feet a little bit wider than the hips, about as wide as the mat, and slightly turned out is equally as safe for the whole body, if not more so, than parallel and internally rotated. And for newer students, having that additional width and slight turnout provides a much greater benefit because it's much easier to get the hip flexors and the quadriceps to lengthen and our posterior side, including glutes and hamstrings, to engage, which should be priorities. So watch. I like to have my new students set up, look at their feet, wiggle their feet about as wide as the mat, ever so slightly turn their feet out and then lay on their back. So we have that set, right? Now the next detail when I'm working with beginners that I really think you're gonna appreciate or your students are gonna appreciate is have your students hold the side of the yoga mat. So it can be really tricky to interlace the fingers underneath you and then if the arms are disconnected and just kinda there, students don't really know what to do with them when they come into the pose. So holding the sides of the mat is a really great option because now we can actually engage the arms because we have something to engage them with. Also, when you're holding the sides of the mat, it's kind of like your fingers are interlaced. The two sides are connected to each other. They're just connected through the medium of the mat. So my feet are a little bit wider than hip width apart. They're ever so slightly turned out. I'm holding the sides of the yoga mat. Then we just have our students press the floor away. We're allowing them to engage the hamstrings and the buttock. We're holding the sides of the yoga mat and then we can cue them to roll to one side, tuck a shoulder slightly under, roll to the other side, tuck the opposite shoulder under. And then finally with new students, because they're holding the mat, I like to have them gently create the action of pulling the mat wider or with the hands stretching the mat laterally or continue to hold the yoga mat but create the action like you're trying to pull your arms away from each other. So what this does everybody is by holding the sides of the mat and creating that lateral traction, you start to really bring the action of the upper arms online. You get much more motion and thoracic opening. 
So again, key details on this when you're working with beginners, go a little bit wider than hip width apart. There's no mechanical downside to it and there's almost always a mechanical advantage to it. Wherever you want them to place their feet, whether it's in accordance with my belief system or if you have a different one, whatever it is, have them see their feet when they place their feet. And then finally, get them to actually use their arms right off the bat. Holding the sides of the yoga mat is a really good strategy to make that happen. All right, everybody, like I said earlier, I'm gonna put three links in the copy below. I'm gonna put a link to the episode of Yoga Land where Andrea and I talk about the broader context of teaching backbends to beginners. And we sort through some of, the, uh, some of the benefits and some of the challenges of doing so. And then I'm gonna put links for both online trainings, the art of teaching beginners and also my 200 hour teacher training program. As always, everybody, I hope this information finds you well and that you're able to use it to help your students uh, be well and grow in their practice. Thanks again for watching.